Good day. What I will be presenting to you is the following. The Passione, a reaction on the possible anti-Semitic content of the Filipino tradition called Passion Hal. This brief review of the traditional sung narrative of the uh, Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ, otherwise known as the Kasaysayan ng Pasyong Mahal na Heso Cristo ang Panginoon natin, is in line with the article about Pavasa, where Bishop Pablo Virgilio David indicated the need to check for anti-Semitic contents therein. Let us first see the historical setting and the development of the textual tradition. The first book, Mahal na Pasyon ni Heso Cristo ang Panginoon natin sa Tula, by Aquino de Belen Version, 1704. This is the first written Pasyon Tagalog made by Gaspar Aquino de Belen in 1704. He hailed from Batangas and served as translator for some Jesuit priests. Mahal na Pasyon ni Heso Cristo ang Panginoon natin sa Tula is not part of the liturgy or the billing of the church which should be observed during Holy Week. The second book, El Libro de la Vida, An- Aniceto de Merced, 1852. Printed in 1852, this book did not prove popular among the masses. The third book, Kasaysayan ng Pasyong Mahal na Heso Cristo ang Panginoon natin na sukat ipag-alab ng puso ng sino mang babasa, otherwise known as Pasyong Henesis, 1814. In this book, the creation narrative precedes the section about the Virgin Mary and Christ. The foreword for this text was attributed to Mariano Pilapil, that is sometimes called Pasyong Pilapil, commissioned by the former Archbishop of Manila, Jose Sigue OSA, and former Agustinian Provincial Manuel Grijalvo OSA. This work had certain Latin phrases corrected by Father Amador W. Cruz. With 2,660 stanzas of five eight-syllable lines, the work begins with the creation of the world, covers the life of Jesus, and ends with Empress Helena's finding the Holy Cross. It has 68 intervening episodes, 20 of which are hortatory lessons or sermons or aral. The text can be read as narrative or salaysay or as dialogues. The fourth book. Awit at Salaysay, 1949, ni Padre Amador W. Cruz. As a well-circulated version of Pasyong Henesis, the 1949 edition was issued by Ignacio Luna and Sons Company. As a sung narrative, the Pasyon was set to various musical settings. The traditional tunes vary among communities. The text is sung to basic or skeletal melodic formula or punto. Old, traditional, chant-like melodies, including, among others, westernized uh, uh, folk songs, operatic airs, and recently on more popular hits. For the puntos, we have Tres Caidas, Cainamayas, Biniolintaro, Binangonan, Sinauna, Tabat, at Inosana, specific styles from different areas. Chanting the entire passion takes about 16 to 20 hours. The chanters, or the mambabasa, read them round robin style or by twos. Later, related forms came up, including sabalan, a game of wit intended to show off one's poetic skill and mastery of the passion text. The protagonists pose a question or a riddle. The rival must answer from the passion text using the passion melodic formula. This can go on until the wee hours of the next day and only ends when one party can no longer answer the other. Nagdamay, nagdapit, nagdamay 
The passion affected the culture of the Filipinos as well as the other way around. Reynaldo Clemenia Eldeto, a Filipino historian, indicated that the popular passion, an epic poem on the life of Jesus Christ, his birth, death, and resurrection, provides the framework for Filipino peasants' emancipation. By considering the similarity of the socio-economic condition during Christ's time and the Philippines under the colonial rulers, the Filipino peasants were able to identify themselves with the oppression of Christ. Christ's lowly image, yet emerged in leadership, inspires Filipinos to bring new order in society, a little subversive perhaps. For the Filipinos, the passion highlighted the values dealing with the salvation of men through Christ's transformative teaching. It also talks about brotherhood, unity, and independence, aspects which Katipunan at that time spoused. As a literary artifact and religious tradition, the passion became a source for understanding the society and politics of its times. The text was seen to present contrasting images about goodness and purity. The colony of the Philippines was presented as a female colonial subject. The two archetypal and contradictory roles of Eve as a source of innate evil and corruption and the Virgin Mary as a representative of goodness and purity are significant in the colonial context. The passion is widely disseminated during the Spanish rule and hence an important tool for Spanish colonization. Show and Ocampo's article analyzed the way imperial and nationalists rely on very different but equally passive representation of the Philippines as female, a woman prostituted by imperialists but held sacred by nationalists. The effect of the passion is pervasive. To father the Spanish colonial leaders in the Philippines, the oral literature of the natives is Christianized. Indigenous epics were replaced by the passion, which is sung in the major languages or dialects. Let us now look at the passion as it is as, as to its content. We find a text to contain pious literature of extra-canonical categories. Various verses in the Passion used pious literature, otherwise not part of the canonical text. Some of the texts highlighted herein comes from several extra-canonical sources. The probable sources for this extra-canonical text have been identified in the succeeding categories. From the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy of the Savior, stanza 343, partly indicates Idolong mga demonyoy na durog na piraso. This verse is hinted at in verse 10 of the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy of the Savior, which runs this way, because he is truly the Son of God. And in the same hour that idol fell down, and all his fall, all inhabitants of Egypt and others, ran together. From the history of Joseph the Carpenter, stanza 438 partly says, Ang kaluluwang marikit nitong timtimang si Joseph sinalubong ng angeles. Verse 22 of the history of Joseph the Carpenter says thus, And then Michael, the prince of your angels, and Gabriel, the herald of lights, and all the lights of your angels, and let their whole array walk with the soul of my father Joseph until they have conducted it to you. From the medieval legend of Judas Iscariot, stanza 1133, part the says of Judas, ng kanyang pinanggalingan at incestong kasalanan. The source for this text may have been the medieval legend of Judas Iscariot, which indicated among others that, number one, his mother, Siborea, dreamt about Judas' birth, but is destined to destroy uh, the whole Jewish race. Number two, set him ad adrift on the sea. Number three, was saved by the queen of Iscariot. 
Number four, the queen raised him as her son. Number five, but later had a son by the king. Number six, Judas maltreated the true prince. Seven, killed him. Eight, got employed by Pilate. Nine, Pilate wanted the fruit which Judas procured. Ten, didn't know that it was Reuben's, Judas' father. Eleven, killed Reuben. Twelve, Pilate arranged for Judas to marry Siborea, his mother. Thus, Judas is portrayed as committing parricide and incest. From the Gospel of Nicodemus, stanza 2004 says, Tayo tumulad kadimas. Gospel of Nicodemus 7.11 indicates, But the thief who was crucified on his right hand, whose name was Demas, answering rebuked him, We indeed receive rightly and justly the demerit of our actions. But this Jesus, what evil hath he done? From Hero's epistle to Pilate, the Passion stands at 2255 may have been taken. Dinapit kapagdaka ang kanyang kaluluwa, angeles na masasaya. Here is the epistle to Pilate, however, relate the following. Now, in the same hour, the angel of the Lord, having laid hold of the head of Elginus, stretched him on the ground in his face, and a lion was so stationed as to come forth at the evening and to consume the body until morning. And in the morning, the lion goeth away, and again his body groweth again, and he suffereth his punishment until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This must have been an early stage of the legend before the story of his conversion and martyrdom. The last textual witness is first witnesses, Martha Longinus and Veronica in the Slavic manuscript tradition. Passion Stanza 22.14 indicates ang bayaning si Longinus di pumayag di sumunod. The Jews offered him money for testifying that Christ has not risen from the dead and that his body has been stolen by the disciples. He refused and accompanied by two fellow soldiers left Jerusalem for his native Cappadocia. All right, we shall now treat of the Jewish interpretative basis, the pardes. A Jewish interpreter usually asks himself whether it is the interpretation of the Bible that denominates theology or whether it is theology that governs the results of exegesis. As a religion based on revelation, exegesis in Judaism is of central concern that every issue is connected with interpretation of scriptural passages. One comprehensive definition of Jewish exegesis engages in fourfold tasks to discover the meaning of the scripture in four levels by means of four exegetical methods, usually called Pesat, Ramets, Deras, and Sod, whose acronym is Pardes. Pesat stands for the literal exegesis, Deras for traditional Haggadic interpretation, Ramets is usually taken to denote the allegorical interpretation introduced by the philosophers, and Sod is the way of the Kabbalah. Gershom Sholem traced the invention of these terms to Moses de Leon, the author of the Sohar, a work which traced this fourfold division in embryonic form. The term Pardes was introduced by de Leon in a book called Sefer HaPardes. Although now no longer extant, the idea found its way into the Zohari corpus, Haya Memhemna and the Tekune Zohar, written in 1290. The significance of Pardes, however, is limited, but calls to mind the vast Midrashic corpus, very much prominent in medieval biblical interpretation. Some attribute the four tenses or senses of a Jewish exegesis to Christian influence. Since the time of Origen, these senses were very much in vogue. Thus, scripture is allegorical, tropological, or moral and an anagogical meaning which leads the believer towards heaven and the literal and historic meaning. This view is held by Sholem. This attribution, however, cannot be proved yet. Similarity between Jewish and Christian exegesis exists, but who influences who is quite difficult to determine. 
The Passion text has apparently certain interpolations. Of these, we shall discuss some. In the Passion, certain stanzas contain storylines, exhortations, and even information that are not provided for in Scripture. To illustrate this, take a look at the following stanza. The apparent literally construct not found in Scripture. Un Ibs slow wittedness. Stanza 70. Gayong wikay ng marinig na ebang mahinang isip. Another one is the Midrash-like interpolation. Certain sequences in the text and even the hortitarian sections are apparent Midrash-like interpolation. Some of the sequences are the following. And Jesus meeting Mary in the Via Dolorosa. The stanzas 1783 to 1846 presents a tearful meeting of Jesus and Mary on the road to Calvary. This is a Midrash-like interpolation, the most probable hint, ma pardes, in remits of the narrative is from Genesis 21.16, referring to the powerlessness of Agar. See her son Ismael in the throes of death. The other one is the theological license. On Lazarus' obeisance to Christ after the raising from the dead. 7.62 Doon nga si Lazaro nagpatira pang totoo sa paan ni Jesus Cristo. Throughout the Passion, one finds the following possible pseudo-attribution. Number one, generalization of the term Hujo as the whole people, although those directly involved in the Passion and Death of Christ are only the leaders. Number two, presenting as Hujo acts that are definitely done by the Romans. Number three, presenting Jews as commanding Roman soldiers. Number four, attributing the acts of Herod Antipas to Herod the Great. Number five, attributing punishment of Herod Agrippa to Herod the Great. Let us now tackle anti-Semitism in the Passion. Coined in 1879 by the German agitator Wilhelm Marr, it designates the anti-Jewish campaigns underway in Central Europe at that time. Although widely used, it is a misnomer, since discrimination against all Semites would mean to include Arabs and other people. Thus, it is not fitting as a label for anti-Jewish prejudices, statements, or actions of Arabs or other Semites. Some flavor of this term can include any of the following. Number one, racial dimension uh, of Nazi anti-Semitism called scientific uh, racism. Two, social segregation in Hellenistic time for Jews' refusal to acknowledge other gods of their other people. Number three, denial of citizenship in Europe during the Middle Ages, including segregation into ghettos. Number four, accusation of ritual murder and of host desecration and the blood libel. Number five, mass expulsion from different countries. Number six, pogroms due to publication of a forgery, protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Number seven, three markers of legitimate criticism and anti-Semitism. Now let us contextualize this. Understanding anti-Semitism in the 19th century. When the Passion was written in the 18th to 19th century, please note that expulsion of the Jews from Spain has already occurred in 1490. And this historical datum has been carried forward to the colonists and even in Spain today. The former Archbishop of Manila, Jose Sigue OSA, was a full-blooded peninsulare. The prevailing ecclesiastical mood at the time is to prevent Maranos and Indios from attaining ecclesiastical positions. The anti-Jewish sentiment still around. This filters down to the pastoral instructions to the, to the lay. As such, the Filipino passion writer could not but be influenced by the anti-Jewish sentiments by clerics in those times. How the passion treats the ethnicity of Jesus. As seen above, the Jewish ethnicity of the protagonists, meaning the Jewish leaders and other Jews on the one hand, and Jesus and his followers on the other, are highlighted but inadvertently downplay Jesus' and his disciples' own Jewishness. The Passion Father encourages readers and hearers to identify with Jesus 
but with minimal focus on his Jewishness. So, in order to understand the meaning that can be gleaned from the Passion, we should get to know the hermeneutics, Western assumptions. The prevailing interpretive nuance of biblical studies focus on how the West thought shape it. Marilo Ibita identified four areas where this is very evident, namely, number one, the ethnic bias on the use of Western languages, number two, Western brand of trans ethnicity in the interpretative process, number three, preference on the methods and approaches with Western bias, four, Western academic preferences on the objective study of the scripture as ancient literature against the Filipinos' regard for the Bible as revelatory of God's will, its relevance to the present context, and a better future. To interpret the passion in Filipino context needs veering off from the Western bias for a more nuanced understanding. Thus, number one, Elito's understanding of the passion as a for framework for Filipino peasants' emancipation makes it a Bildungs Roman. Number two, there is no anti-Semitism in the Passion, despite the verses illustrated above. And number three, the negative char characterization of Jews in the Passion can be seen not as a Filipino anti-Semitism, but rather within the context of the Spanish colonial anti-Semitic stance. Therefore, in summary, Sang Passion narrative needs the updating necessary to correct the seemingly incongruous details found in the text. The correction should focus on the scriptural base of the narrative. As published and initiated, the flow of the Passion narrative is directed to the expression of the Filipino sentiment about prevailing social realities in the 19th century. Thus, the attribution of the actions of the characters in the Passion to the ruling Spanish rulers is all the more understandable and within the context of the time. However, the need to address these misleading details in the spirit of Nostra Etate is more deeply needed now than ever. Though not included in this article, a proposed updating of the text of Kasaysayan and Pasyon Mahal in Esto Christum Panginoon Natin, copyright 1949 by Ignace Luna, as a separate cover, is intended to update the text and align the narratives of the biblical text with the caveat that poetic expression be left to those who are immersed into this literary art. Thank you.